All right. Good afternoon. Thanks everyone for being here. I have that we're at noon here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce on behalf of the Cori Colloquium series and CIDP, uh, Professor Megan McKenzie. Professor McKenzie is the Simons Chair in International Law and Human Security at Simon Fraser University. Uh, she's interested in war security studies and post-conflict recovery and reconstruction in military culture. Her research interests investigates the way that gender matters in understanding war and security and the ways that experience of war and insecurity are, are shaped by gender norms and sexism. And her work covers broad topics, including gender violence, gender integration, and suicide in the military. She's authored, authored three books, Feminist Solutions to Ending War, Beyond the Band of Brothers, the U.S. Military, and the, the Myth that Women Can't Fight, and Female Soldiers in Sierra Leone, Sex, Security, and Post-Conflict Development. Her work has appeared in numerous scholarly journals, including International Studies Quarterly, Security Studies, and Foreign Affairs. We're very pleased to have her here today for a presentation entitled Good Soldiers Don't Rape. So please join me in welcoming me, uh, Professor Megan McKenzie. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here on a Friday. Um, and thank you to the Department of Political Studies and the Center for International and Defense Policy for inviting me and Rachel for all the logistics. Um, I am really pleased to be here. This is actually my first time being at Queen's, um, despite being a Canadian um, and living abroad for many years. But it's really nice to be here for the first time. Um, I do want to start by acknowledging that we're on unceded stolen First Nations land, and I live and work on traditional ancestral um, territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And, you know, in making that statement, it's really a recommitment to efforts around reconciliation, land back, um, and reparations. <clears throat> So it's a little weird. <laughs> There's a lot of posters with my face on it. I feel like I walked by all of them. Um, so thank you. They, they look great. Um, but I'm happy to talk today about my book, which came out a few months ago um, on sexual violence in defense forces. And really, it's a comparative analysis of um, the Australian, uh, Canadian, and U.S. Defense Forces. And certainly this is something that's um, I've been working on for a long time, but very much, you know, I just did a, uh, a media interview this morning um, because some of the high profile cases are, are starting to go to trial of senior defense leaders in the Canadian Armed Forces. So this is certainly an ongoing, ever present issue. Um, so I want to... Um, just organize my talk really around <clears throat> some of these uh, themes. First, talk a little bit about why I wrote this book. Um, and then some of the, uh, what I did, what research informs the book, uh, what some of my findings are, and then some of the recommendations. As I was chatting earlier, I don't have a silver bullet fix, unfortunately, but I do have some recommendations and and ideas of uh, ways forward. So I've been studying um, and writing about military culture for over a decade now. Um, and I've been focused mainly on Canada, Australia, um, the US and New Zealand, which are four countries that I've lived and worked in. Um, and I've spoken to many service members, worked with service members in each of those um, countries, mostly women. Um, and while I was writing about other issues, including um, the combat exclusion for women, uh, military culture, suicidality, gender integration, sexual violence really kept coming up as sort of the elephant in the room or a major theme in all of that other research, uh, particularly when it came to female service members. Um, so throughout the discussion, just to um, give you a heads up. I use the term military sexual violence or MSV. So if you hear me saying MSV, it's it's a term that I use really to get away from the term sexual misconduct, which is a term that the defense forces use, um, but really doesn't have any relevance in the civilian um, justice system. So military sexual violence I use as an umbrella term to refer to all forms of sexual violence. 
Um, and if you're interested in why I do that, I can say a little bit more later. Um, but just to say that, um, you know, a few reasons. I did feel initially that I wasn't qualified to write about sexual violence in the defense forces, but because it was such an ever-present issue, I decided to um, spend more time focusing on it. So just to give you a sense, I know that in the Canadian context, for those of you that have been, have been watching the news the last couple of years, you have a sense, but just to give a kind of global sense of the problem, um, in Australia, uh, female service members have a one in four chance of being harassed or assaulted over the course of their career. Um, between 2016 and 2018, the U.S. military saw a 38% increase in cases of sexual assault. And many of you will know that in um, July 2019, the Canadian government announced it would pay nearly a billion dollars to members of uh, military and defense who are part of a class action lawsuit, lawsuit claiming systemic and widespread sexual misconduct. So nearly 19,000 Canadian Armed Forces and Defense personnel submitted claims as part of that class action lawsuit. Um, and Canada, you know, is also, as many of you know, has been in a crisis with over 12 senior CAF leaders uh, facing allegations of military sexual violence in the past um, three years. And I had, an, you know, as I mentioned, I had an interview <laughs> This morning about um, Hayden Edmondson's trial, who many, for those of you who don't know, who was the head of military personnel. This is someone who was promoted. Uh, head of military personnel means he's in charge of um, deciding what happens to individuals who face sexual misconduct allegations. This is someone who early in his career faced allegations, was had the nickname of the Mulligan Man, which meant he was able to um, kind of survive allegations. Um, he was promoted by Jonathan Vance, who was a former CDS who faced allegations of sexual misconduct, who was replaced by Ar Arthur McDonald, who also faced allegations of sexual misconduct. And the person who went, uh, who replaced Hayden Edmondson also faced sexual misconduct allegations. So just to sort of paint a picture of how, um, how, how bad things are in terms of senior, uh, senior leaders embroiled in allegations um, at this moment. And the trials are, are still underway. Um, so we also have evidence that really the data we have on military sexual violence, it's often not very good. And it's often unrepresentative from data from other countries indicate that over 80% of victims don't report um, their assault. So we know that military sexual violence affects victims deeply and can have complex and long-term impacts on the health and well-being of, of victims. Um, sexual violence is associated with pregnancy and gynecological complications, sexual transmitted diseases, increased risk of suicide and suicide ideation, post-traumatic stress, career interruption, and social ostracization. So besides the sort of deep and uh, significant impacts of violence on individuals, there's massive institutional costs. And it sort of seems insensitive to talk about costs associated with this problem, but there are significant costs related to this um, issue. Um, militaries of the three case countries that I focus on spend millions of dollars every year for costs related to MSV, including health costs, the costs of settling claims, costs associated with investigations, training, victim support, recruitment to replace service members um, who leave or take time off due to work, uh, work due to injury, mental health, um, or for disciplinary measures. So besides the cost, this is an operational issue. Um, we know right now that one in four jobs in the Canadian Armed Forces is vacant. And often it seems like the CAF has been unable to connect this institutional sexual misconduct crisis with its broader cultural crisis and its recruitment and retention crisis. Um, so as I mentioned, for years, I really felt um, underqualified to write about this topic. I'm not a psychologist. Um, I'm not a service member or a veteran. And I really wasn't sure I had the skills to do justice to such an important topic. Uh, but I finally felt compelled to tackle one aspect of this issue, which is the public stories that we tell 
um, about military sexual violence. And I'm looking specifically at media coverage. So <clears throat> the core uh, questions of the book really center around the question of why, despite evidence that this problem of MSV has existed for decades, why does media coverage and military leader statements still depict the problem as if it's exceptional, a surprise, or the result of you know, a specific scandalous case? And I'm really interested in why is it that decades of evidence of high rates of MSV haven't seemed to impact public trust in the institution or raise questions about the need for a systemic change. We're starting to have these conversations about systemic change, um, but whether that translates um, into significant action, is, it still remains to be seen. So, um, so the core, I guess, puzzle that I chose to focus on for this book is really that sexual violence has been persistent. We've known about high rates of sexual violence in defense forces for decades. Uh, certainly right now we're in a moment where we have very high profile cases, but the rates of sexual uh, misconduct have not necessarily gone up significantly. They've been high for a very long time. Um, and yet we still have these um, this ability to represent the institution um, as disciplined, um, and having a longstanding uh, culture of camaraderie and protection. And so I'm interested in how the military keeps covering this problem as if it's a surprise. And I argue that there are a number of compelling stories and myths about military sexual violence that are told in public, in media conversations in particular, um, that normalize and help the public make sense of military sexual violence. So really in terms of uh, what exactly I did uh, for the for the actual analysis, I studied 30 years of media coverage in Australia, the US and Canada um, of, you know, mainstream, the, the sort of top news outlets in, in those um, countries, and really looking at um, consistent narratives, consistent stories in the way that this issue was covered over time. So I'm interested in the stories we tell about military sexual violence and the way these stories may close out space for alternative ways of making sense of military sexual violence and may inhibit um, action or systemic change that could reduce it. So what I found you know, overall, so just so I give the conclusion of my, my main findings ahead is that across actually all three case countries and even across the 30 years, one of the most consistent findings was that military sexual violence was consistently presented either as a problem that's already being solved um, or a problem so endemic that it can't be solved. So it's either not a problem at all and, and therefore not requiring uh, solving or a problem that's already um, been handled. So I argue that these narratives really unite with the singular message of justified inaction. Basically, there's nothing to be done. Um, so I'll kind of get into some of the, um, the reasons why I chose media coverage. And I will just add a caveat that I do focus primarily on female victims of sexual violence and male perpetrators. Um, certainly, we have lots of evidence that um, men and, and gender diverse service members are also affected by sexual violence. The data is not as great. And most of the media coverage that I analyzed almost exclusively focused on female victims. And most of the high profile cases that we see focus on, on female victims. So um, in terms of why I chose to focus on media coverage, um, a couple of reasons. So just to be clear, that my, my book really isn't designed to be a media analysis or a critique of, uh, of uh, journalistic practices, but really it provides sort of an outlet to, to sort of analyze public conversations around this issue over time. So I, I think media coverage is useful for a couple of reasons. One, it's the primary... Um, it's a primary source of information for most civilians when it comes to uh, anything to do with the military. Um, 
And media coverage includes statements uh, from military and political uh, leaders, opinion pieces. So in many ways, it reflects public conversations as it shapes them. And a second sort of more, I guess, theoretical or, or um, reason is we know that from, from research on civilian sexual violence, we know that um, analyzing media is useful in that media coverage of civilian sexual violence has found that public narratives have historically been shaped by gender bias and what researchers have called um, rape myths. So feminist work in the 1980s and 1990s was very sort of pivotal in changing the way we talk about sexual violence. So feminists talked about, use this term rape myths, which refers to prejudicial, stereotyped, or false beliefs about rape, rape victims, or rapists. And specific rape myths in the civilian context include versions of she was asking for it, women lie, good guys don't rape. Um, and research found that um, when rape myths are accepted, there are increased negative perceptions of rape survivors, lower conviction rates, and lower sentences for perpetrators, and police reports that reproduce rape myths. And so this work in the civilian context has been so important that we now don't see uh, media coverage talking about what a victim was wearing because it, it you know that that feminist scholarship basically changed the way that police were were taking reports and what was accept considered acceptable in terms of the conversations and while this is really important and significant there hasn't been similar analysis of sexual violence in the military context to understand if there's particular rape myths or particular gendered myths um, present in public conversations about military sexual violence. So that's what I was really interested to see if there's something significant or something specific to the ways we talk about military sexual violence. Um, and so I won't say too much about uh, methods. If you're interested, I can get into that. But basically, you know, with hundreds of articles, I did do a content analysis, a thematic analysis, and then a narrative analysis. Really, I was looking mostly, the, 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 the parts that were most interesting to me were the overarching complete stories that were told consistently over time. So I'll just give you a visual to keep in your mind as I go through. Um, just to give you a sense of why media coverage matters as well. Um, so these are, um, these graphs show the U.S. and for Canada, basically the total number of articles over this uh, 1990 to 2013 period that focus on, I'll tell you about the dots later, but basically you can see that in the absence of basically high profile scandalous cases, this are this issue is off the radar, um, and this is despite rates of sexual violence during this period stayed relatively the same. So media attention is really important in in garnering public attention to this, and also high profile cases um, are important and sort of shape the conversations in in a major way. So in the book, I have a whole chapter on the defining cases for each of the three countries, which I won't get into, but if you're interested. Um, I can certainly talk about that later. So I want to say something about the main theoretical concepts that I use um, throughout the book. Um, I've already talked about rape myths, but I do situate my work within broader conversations around rape culture. And this is why the title of the book for me was really important. Um, so the term rape culture has been frequently used in the last decade and sometimes poorly defined. Um, Black feminists developed a really a clear understanding of rape culture as a masculine system of control that treats sexual and physical domination as an articulation of, of power and supremacy. So I'm kind of loosely paraphrasing Patricia Hill Collins in particular here. Um, and really, when we're talking about rape culture broadly, this is sort of the systems that um, that normalize violence and domination in our culture. And one of the main claims driving this book is that if we want to understand rape culture writ large, you know, outside of the military institution, we need to explore how high rates of sexual violence are normalized in our most trusted public institutions. 
And of course, right now, as we have another very beloved Canadian institution facing similar kinds of scandal, I think this is partly, you can see the, the parallels to the conversation with Hockey Canada. Um, a second concept that I use, and I've been thinking of this concept for a very long time and really develop it in this book, is military exceptionalism. And so again, really grounded in Black feminist work and feminist critical military scholarship, and really particularly the scholarship of Shreen Razak. Um, I use this concept to talk about how military exceptionalism is shaped by ideals of good militaries and good soldiers which are constructed as necessarily white, masculine, exclusive. So more than many other workplaces, military institutions are framed as very exceptional, uh, worthy as a, uh, as a, um, framed as a form of um, military work, sorry, it's framed as a form of um, discipline sacrifice um, that ex is extreme and worthy of reverence. And so I'm not trying to argue that military work is not um, exceptional or is not very different from other workplaces, but it really holds a very different place in the public imagination. So I argue that military exceptionalism really captures the complex and sometimes paradoxical ways that good militaries and good soldiers are seen to be both disciplined protectors of the nation, exercising legitimate violence, and untamable and always capable of reasonable um, indiscipline and illegitimate violence. And I think this is particularly the case um, in some contexts that the good soldier has been constructed as both stoic, professional, and controlled, but also has that untamable inner warrior um, that sort of comes undone either as a result of being overcome by witnessing violence and the specter of evil and war zones, as Shireen Razak says. So this sort of paradoxical way that we sort of think of, uh, especially in, in the context of uh, war fighting, the potential of legitimate uh, indiscipline. And then the last uh, concept I work with is the concept of institutional gaslighting. And this is another concept that has been used loosely and frequently in many contexts, um, and has sometimes been used to refer to um, a practice within intimate relationships um, when someone is caused to question um, their sanity or perception of reality. So building on, on Black feminist scholarship, I define institutional gaslighting really as more systemic efforts to sustain existing power structures, to deny institutional problems and to try and uh, work towards sustaining existing systems. So with that sort of conceptual terrain in mind, I'll take you through um, some of the main findings. So again, just to give you a sense of the analysis, one of the main goals was to look for overarching stories, overarching complete narratives that were told over time. And I guess when I was going into the analysis, I did think that we would see significant change over time, particularly from the early 90s to, to now. What I can tell you is there's not a lot of significant change in the public conversations around sexual violence. There's um, several narratives that actually persist across the three case countries and across the 30 year period. So I'll talk about those overarching narratives first, and then I'll talk a little bit about each of the case countries have their own specific narratives. There's very unique aspects to the Australian Defense Forces, the Canadian Defense Forces, and the US military. So I'll get into the specifics around, um, some of the specifics around the Canadian Defense Forces after. So three of the overarching narratives that sort of come through in media coverage. The first is that sexual violence um, is really there are essential elements to military culture that lead to military sexual violence. And this is the sort of story that sexual violence is a natural if unfortunate byproduct of military culture that requires tough, combat ready, good warriors. And in some ways, this is a story of another version of boys will be boys, but soldiers will be soldiers. This idea that well in close confines, when you have young men working together and the pressures of, of work, that there may be some persistent sexual violence or persistent forms of illicit behavior. A second overarching um, narrative is 
really that military are a hostile place for women. And this kind of came through consistently in media coverage through almost questioning why women even want to be there. The, the idea that why would women want to be uh, in defense forces, especially in uh, male dominated um, uh, services. And this idea that women who choose to join the military should know what they're up against and should sort of know the risks and calculate the risks. Um, uh, and almost this idea that women, the problem of sexual violence is the problem of women's, women's presence in the institution. And then the last overarching narrative um, that comes through in media coverage. And of course, as I said, media coverage includes statements by political leaders, statements by defense leaders, opinion pieces, is that only military leaders know how to handle the problem of sexual violence. And this idea sort of that the public um, often misunderstands or misdiagnose or overreacts to the unique nature of sexual violence within defense forces. And in some cases, civilian expertise is called into question as overreaction, hysterical, inexpert, uh, and this this sort of message of leaving it to the expert, leaving it to the experts. And so, you know, I know these are this is a, a summary of these uh, overarching narratives, but just to give you a sense of some how this kind of plays through in in particular articles. So, an example was in two thousand fifteen. Um, General Tom Lawson, who was then the Canadian chief of the defense staff, he suggested sexual violence, some of you will remember, uh, would naturally be present in any institution dominated by men. He claimed that male soldiers are, quote, biologically wired in a certain way to believe it is a reasonable thing to press themselves and their desires on others. And so remember, he was the chief of defense staff that came before Vance, that came before um, Arthur um, McDonald. So another example um, in Australia in 2012, this was uh, reported in a couple of, and, and actually several articles, a former Air Force pilot cl claimed that you cannot expect, quote, testosterone to remain dormant when men and women are at the peak of their sexuality, when training them to be warriors and putting them together in a semi-cloistered environment. And that quote comes through consistently over time, this idea that you know, men and women at that point in their careers are 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 un, sort of untamable. That putting them together in a semi cloistered environment, this idea that working in close confines adds another layer of impossibility in terms of controlling um, sexual violence. Um, a couple other quotes we have here. Um, I'll just let you read them so I can take a breath. <laughs> and so I did identify four particular narratives for the Canadian Defense Forces or, or for Canadian military co uh, media coverage. And Canadian media coverage is very distinct from U.S. media coverage and Australian media coverage. Australian media coverage is its own thing because of Murdoch, and you know, and the the kind of casual um, nature of Australian media coverage and the language. It's very specific and very different. Um, I will say, just in terms of context, military sexual violence wasn't even covered as if it was a systemic problem until. You know, McLean's magazine did a feature in 1998, which was a major contribution to putting this on uh, on the agenda in Canada. But it really wasn't regularly treated as a as a systemic problem until closer to 2015. And proper data on sexual violence in the Canadian Armed Forces wasn't collected until 2015. So we're really a little behind on this issue um, in terms of collecting data and understanding the nature of the problem, but in terms of also the conversations. So some of the specific narratives that come through in Canadian media coverage is this narrative that military sexual violence is a complex problem that takes time. 
And you hear, you hear, uh, you know, former Minister of Defense uh, Anita Anand uh, recently said this. We have, we hear military leaders saying this really very regularly that we need time, that these ca changes can happen overnight. We hear this around um, culture change. Um, a second narrative is really kind of treats military sexual violence as if it's a force of nature, or sort of like a plague, using language like a plague, a, an epidemic, but not really kind of being clear about what is the source of the problem. Um, and a third overarching narrative really uh, frames military sexual violence as an embarrassment of the institution, uh, a potential um, liability when it comes to recruitment, uh, and at odds with um, the need to be proud of the institution. Um, and then the last is this overlap with sort of the, the idea of military is a boys club and not a place for women. So just to go back to this first one, I think it's really an, an important one to reflect on and just to take pause, particularly in this moment when we're being told that, that this is sort of a watershed moment for the Canadian Defence Forces and we're in the midst of um claims of massive culture change um and this idea of this narrative of of a complex problem um is interesting and i think sometimes can take a patronize or patronizing tone uh in some of the articles and and commentary and sort of this idea that you need to be patient that sensible solutions take a long time and even that we're sort of still trying to understand the nature of the problem. We need more evidence and we need more research. Um, and what's implied by this narrative is that efforts to respond to the problem are overly simplistic or could be rushed or um, you know, waiting to take time is actually the preferred option. And so it sort of legitimizes or makes inaction or pausing seem like the sensible choice. Um, so I did more than any other book that I've written, spend quite a lot of time thinking about solutions. Um, but just to give you a sense of what the com complex problem quote looks like. I mean, I could find you 50 quotes that look exactly like this, even from the last few weeks, to be honest. Um, and this isn't to say that people aren't well-meaning, but this becomes a really uh, almost a, a rhetorical loop that I think we can get stuck in. Um, so I do have a whole chapter on recommendations, and I think it's important, you know, with this kind of critique to provide clear recommendations, particularly to those um, covering this issue in the media, but also to those of us who are talking about it publicly um, uh, as, as experts or some people who have studied this issue. So a couple of recommendations, I guess, that are more for um, journalists or, or those covering is one to center the reputation of the military or the perpetrator, or or quite frankly, the, the victim. I think that we have a tendency in media coverage to mention, for example, the alleged perpetrator's years of service, service record, deployments, record of their unit, leadership history, or other aspects of their history that isn't really relevant to the legal case at hand. And it's not something we see in the civilian context or we try to avoid uh, that in the civilian context that still comes through. For, for example, in the case, um, I think Brock Turner, you know, the, the alleged um, uh, who, was, who faced allegations of rape and the, you know, there was a, quite a focus on his uh, potential as, as a swimmer and uh, his record. But I do think um, uh, unless it's a mention of rank in order to understand power differentials that this these sort of details of someone's um, service records shouldn't be part of a public conversation. A second um, recommendation is to try not to attempt to provide alternative or balanced views of on MSV by interviewing other service members who say they've never experienced military sexual violence. And this is something that actually was a pattern, particularly in US media coverage. And it, what's really interesting, I don't know why, so it was different reporters, so it wasn't even just a reporter style, but the New York Times consistently, when there was a high profile case, would find 
female service members, often female service members who were in their first or second year of uh, service to sort of say, I've never had this experience. I, I've never faced this. And what's what's really interesting, I, I quote some of them in the book, and I've since met one of the women who was quoted at 21, who really felt embarrassed that, you know, at the time that was her experience, but she was also in the second year of her job, didn't have an understanding of this, this sort of broader context. So I think there's you know, there's always sort of pressure, I think, from, from journalists to sort of have this balanced perspective, but that voice of having someone say, I've never had that experience can gaslight, this is where I'm using the term gaslight, can make victims of sexual violence feel like, well, my experience is unique or problematic. And it sort of reaffirms that, that this is potentially just a, a, a one-off problem rather than a systemic problem to the public. Another kind of, I guess, more technical, but I think important, especially as um, media outlets lose funding and have less capacity for investigative potential and really understanding defense culture and understanding how to ask questions, having time to follow up, is really to encourage outlets not to publish military press releases verbatim, which does actually happen more often than you'd think. Um, you know, there's there's a, a interest of any institution in managing their reputation. Uh, but I think it's important to ask follow-up questions, to put press releases into a broader context, um, and, uh, rather than just sort of reproduce. Um, a third, a fourth, sorry, um, recommendation is to not use the term zero tolerance. Um, I have a whole section on zero tolerance. I became very obsessed with the term zero tolerance because it comes across in all media coverage. It is the instant reaction of political and military leaders when there's a scandal. We have a zero tolerance for sexual violence in the defense forces. I could find you, you know, just dozens and dozens and dozens of statements that certainly I think I can understand and appreciate a desire to, to express a commitment to zero tolerance. But even in these statements, there's often a reference to zero tolerance policy, which there is, there's, that does not exist. Um, and there isn't a reference to sort of what the, what is meant by zero tolerance. So how is that being operationalized? And I do think that um, it can it can be harmful to victims who hear consistently by uh, uh, military leaders that there's a zero to zero tolerance policy um, in the face of evidence to the contrary. And then the last recommendation, again, I guess is sort of. Um, is quite specific but important um, is to ensure that reporters who regularly cover military or defense have some distance from public affairs officers. And this is just really the case that um, I think uh, journalists who work with military and work with services for a long time can develop relationships over time. Um, there's lots of examples I can point to, and I think it becomes more challenging for them to write critically uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, and I think, you know, some, sometimes that critical reflection can be lost. So, the, so these are the dot, these are dots are the zero tolerance statements I'm talking about. So I won't get into it too much, but just to show you that <laughs> these are, I tried to map, and of course it's not an exhaustive list of any time anyone used the phrase zero tolerance, but, but how often it came across in media coverage. I think I counted 41 in the Canadian context and, and sort of 44 or, or, or vice versa. Um, but you sort of see the pattern, right? Where there's a high profile case, a, a surge in media coverage, and then a, a, an onslaught of zero tolerance statements. And then it dies off. And I guess what I would sort of say, not to conclude, I'm not not to sort of be too um, <laughs> negative, but I think where we're at right now in Canadian is sort of right about here, not in time, but a huge influx in attention. We've had a lot of commitments and we see attention to this issue dying down. And what we know from these patterns is that atten attention to the issue can can disappear for a decade, for a very long period of time. And so scandals and commitments, 
don't always translate into sustained attention. So I guess my concern is really about um, ensuring that this stays on the agenda and that real change um, happens. So I wanna end on talking about a few recommendations of what to do, um, particularly when it comes to media context, but also public conversations. So the first is to always put scandals or high profile cases in a broader context. So most of the articles, actually the majority of articles um, over the 30 year period didn't put, or and, and many for much of that period of time, didn't have the data to put an individual case into a broader context. So, so say, well, this particular case is one of uh, an example where we have 25% of female service members experiencing sexual violence. So it's, it's easy for the public to think this is a one-off or this is unusual. And I think it's important to always try and, and put that data um, into, uh, into a, an article uh, rather than just focus on the scandal. I think focusing on follow-up questions when leaders offer zero tolerance statements. And, and I know the, the, UK defense, the uh, UK defense forces have actually come up with a zero tolerance policy in the last couple of years, a specific zero tolerance policy. Um, but it's, it's helpful to understand or even to think about what would it look like to have zero tolerance for sexual misconduct and how, how it might that be different from what we have right now. Um, third is to use professional and victim-centered language to describe incidents of alleged uh, or, or alleged incidents of, of sexual violence. So um, even, in the, even in the case that we see with the hockey players, we see language of um, non-consensual vaginal intercourse, which is legally, I'm always baffled around some of this language that the, the lack of ability to, to use the term rape or to use the proper legal term. Um, and this happens, you know, not just in the military, in, in military cases, but, but um, more broadly, I will say not to throw Australia under the bus, but the Australian media has been really bad, particularly I think around the sort of um, making sexual violence seem like it's sort of like a bad date or a date gone wrong. And you see these terms like sex romp and um, uh, sex pest, and it really diminishes the seriousness of this as a crime and also fails to use legal terms to describe what's happening. And I will say for the few cases of um, where coverage focuses on male victims, um, this is particularly the case where sexual violence is often framed as hazing or um, bullying rather than an actual uh, uh, form of sexual violence. And then the last is to really write follow-up stories to scandals and to sort of try and maintain tension beyond the scandal moment, which I think is, is very hard for journal journalists to do and also requires public attention on the issue. But we do see that pattern of, you know, where this issue really disappears from the public eye so quickly. Um, and I think, you know, following up on, on the justice system, how cases are covered, what happens with all these cases. We've had these articles mapping out the 12 or 13 senior Canadian Defence Forces embroiled in sexual misconduct allegations. And it would be helpful to sort of have follow up on what has happened with each of those cases so the public has a better understanding of, of the military of the justice system and how how things result. So um, I think I'll end it there. I'm happy to um, you know follow up on any of those things um, and and you know, pick up the threads with your questions. Thank you. Tyler Danilo, visiting defense fellow from the U.S. Uh, and I, I'm hoping to kind of break my mental model here a little bit when it comes to media co uh, coverage, but it seems like the only thing that actually hits the media is if it's a high ranking uh, individual uh, or an actual scandal. And so I guess if you look to expand your data set, I guess the scary question is how much do you think it would expand based off of what we kind of know happens below the scenes with lower ranking individuals versus what may actually hit the media? Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting, I mean, that's why I have a whole chapter focused on these high profile cases and how, you know, for for example, in the US, tail hook really shaped the conversation around sexual misconduct in the US for a decade. I mean, it really um, was so pivotal in terms of a, a major case. And you're right, in the meantime, there's sexual violence cases all the time that are not sort of meeting that threshold. Um, I do think it's still important to think about how we talk about these major public cases. And, and I understand, you know, I can appreciate journal why journalists cover these high profile cases. They're trying to help the public understand why there would be such a huge problem. You know, often there, there's reason to, to gain attention. Um, but I think that's why I'd be interested if, or encourage journalists to always put it into context, understand that tail hook um, is sort of part of, of a systemic problem. And also think about Hockey Canada. You know, this, this case of these five individuals is part of a context where group sex is normalized in hazing. It's part of, it's something that's a very well-known part of hockey culture. It's sort of, to sort of put that into a broader context. And those are difficult conversations, to be honest. Um, so, so it's not putting all the pressure on journalists, but certainly to understand when we have these conversations of scandals where there might be an opportunity to bring in the broader context. It ends up being an iceberg theory thing because what it hits the media is very yeah. small percentage of yeah. like the actual effect. Yeah. Across all four groups. Yeah, I agree. Hi there. Um, my question is focused mostly on Canada, but it can apply to the other cases. Um, if you did incorporate this, did you find a variance when it came to cases where the individuals um, coming forward or just the media reporting on veterans versus active forces members? Yeah, so I focused only on active ser uh, actively serving members. Um, I think just partly just to confine, you know, I was already analyzing you know, 3000 articles, but also because I do think I was interested in how we talk about the internal problem. And certainly that's not to say that there's aren't other sexual violence problems, including, you know, domestic violence, sexual violence on bases, different forms of, of violence. But I did sort of put a put a line around it for active Thank you. All right, Colonel Mike Babin, the Canadian Armed Forces Visiting Defense Fellow at, uh, at Queen's. Super interesting, right? It's been top of uh, top of uh, discussion for, for a few years. One one the interesting when you when you differentiate early in your in your uh, presentation between sexual misconduct as defined by the Canadian Armed Forces right now and, and sexual violence. How did you how did you separate those two categories? Because a lot of incidents that we we did well, we not not me personally, but we the CAF came to define that to include all things that had any kind of relationship to to gender and sexual, not just violence, physical violence. Mm -hmm. So did that did you struggle with that? Because a yeah. lot of these articles would would refer to the things that may not be physical violence, but have something to do with 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 sex and, and, and gender. Yeah. I'd be interested in your, your take on it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, I thought a lot about definitions. And I know that the CAF has thought about these terms as well. And Madame Arbor has, has made recommendations around the terminology. For me, my main one of my main problems with sexual misconduct is that it centers the institution, that that it's a violation, that's a it's another form of misconduct. So it's sort of a violation of the code of conduct rather than a form of violence against an individual. So I like to move away from that. Um, and one of the reasons, so for example, in the Australian Defense Forces, sexual misconduct wasn't even disaggregated from other forms of misconduct until, you know, well into, so I think, 2012. So it's just another form of, literally just another form of misconduct. And so it became very difficult to understand how it differs from sort of being drunk on post or, you know, very, very different forms of violence. And also like the CAF, one of the things I, I think I, I really agree with the CAF is the way they've had this sort of spectrum of sexual violence. Um, I do think that the language of 
sexual harassment and differentiating from sexual violence, and this is why I use the term rape culture, still sort of gives the impression that there's low level forms of sexual violence. And I do think it's actually that permissive culture that's created by low, quote unquote, low level forms of sexual violence that often is permissive and creates the conditions for aggravated sexual assault. So we know, and I know from talking to service members and we know from victim advocates that it's very rare that a victim is sort of just assaulted out of the blue, that often there's sort of a pattern of grooming, a pattern of these low level forms of, you know, weird texts or or things that so to kind of actually treat them all seriously and I think that's what the term rape culture tries to capture is that rather than just focusing on these like extreme forms of sexual violence to sort of see it in a spectrum and and to treat these you know off-color jokes as as serious as uh, you know as part of this wider systemic problem yeah Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Very, very interesting. My question is kind of actually to maybe if you could elaborate a bit on this like degree, whether or not you found these like these generalized narratives also having kind of playing into these degrees of sexual violence in terms of like this higher, higher, like are only the ones that are like high, kind of this higher level picked up versus the smaller. I'm putting small in the mix. I think yeah. all of it's violence. Um, I, I was wondering if you speak a bit more about that. And relatedly, did you find any kind of um, distinct narratives that kind of intersect with questions of like race and other um, mm -hmm. intersectional um, yeah. identities? Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Um, so for the first question, I think, you know, a, an example that might help illustrate for those of you who don't aren't as familiar with the Australian context, I guess one of the defining scandals for the Australian Defense Forces was, was a scandal that became known as the Skype sex scandal. And really it involved um, cadets, two cadets who were having consensual sex, uh, the male involved um, Skyped the sex without the woman's consent to friends in, in other rooms. And then video and, and images from that were shared. And this was in 2011, when there were not a lot of conversations about digital safety and um, digital rights and digital consent. And so a lot of the media coverage around this, and you see this even not to keep going back to the Hockey Canada thing, but you do see it in the in the in this case where there's concern about, um, you know, where who is the worst perpetrator and and whether, um, you know, how to define consent in that kind of complex situation, and so a lot of the media coverage on the Skype, Skype sex scandal was actually like jovial, kind of like it was like you know, um, because it was assumed that the sex was, you know, the sex was consent, that that there had been no violation. And so it was, it took a long time for the public conversation to kind of catch up and understand that this was a severe violation for the victim. And I think we see that partly because it feels like um, there is this spectrum still and people, I think, fail to understand that. Uh, what researchers have told us is that someone can have a, a sort of low level experience of sexual violence or multiple low level experiences of sexual violence over the entire course of their career that can be massively detrimental to their, their well being. Um, so, this assumption of impact of victim correlating with where your violence sits on the spectrum, I think, is something that uh, victim advocates are trying to get rid of in terms of that spectrum. Um, that's not to say that that's represented in media coverage yet, because I do think most of the high profile cases do focus on extreme forms of violence uh, or senior leaders or particularly salacious kind of details to a scandal. Um, in terms of <laughs> intersectional, I mean, I'm laughing only because the conversation is so is so not caught up with that. We don't even have good data on we we barely have good data on on um on female victims of sexual violence we don't have intersectional data in in these three case countries i will say that the us defense forces particularly because they've had political pressure collect incredible data on sexual violence we know the worst military bases we know what rank we know what services and and it's 
better, they're better able to diagnose the problem. We're, I think in the Canadian Armed Forces still kind of catching up in terms of how to collect data. And certainly uh, we don't have, and, and most of the scandals, actually all of the scandals that I map out are uh, white women victims. So I think I think that's an important part of the story, and and certainly I deal with that in the theoretical chapter and thinking about um, how violence is legitimized. One of the top scandalous cases in the U.S. involved um, a black um, alleged perpetrator, and certainly we saw a difference in how that was covered. Um, so I talk about that in the in the book. Hi, um, uh, something that jumped out to me on the recommendation slide of what not to do uh, was that two uh, kind of indicated problems that at least in part arise from the decline of the newsroom, uh, which is obviously something that's been uh, marked in change during this time period. I was wondering if you could touch a bit more on how the decline of the newsroom perhaps has made the problem stickier than it could have been with more active coverage. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think having sustained public attention on any major social issue, <laughs> it requires um, a very active, um, informed public media. And so I think it, this is no different. I think the, the particular challenges when it comes to military is you need someone who understands how the institution functions, who has contacts, who knows how to ask good questions. Um, and often, you know, what we've seen over the last 30 years is the number of uh, military and defense experts shrink and their need to cover expansive issues expand, you know, their, their, their mandates expand. And so I definitely think that's, that's impacted. Um, it's impacted how long someone can, can follow a story. We don't see, you know, the kinds of long-standing investigative journalism. So if you think about the McLean's magazine exposés that came out, I think, so in 1998, and then the second one, I think in 2014, that required journalists to work on something for months at a time. And many journalists just don't have that luxury. And so I would say the conversation in Canada would be a decade behind if it weren't for those McLean's pieces. So it's so important to have that. And I do, I do worry, not because I don't think there's dedicated journalists, I just think they're under a lot of pressure. And I also think the public is engaging with media differently now in terms of how we read stories, where we're paying, what we're paying attention to. Yeah. Thanks very much for your talk. I have a question that pairs quite nicely with the previous one. I'm really curious about the public relations aspect and especially the relationship between journalists and those that might work at CAF and try to massage news stories, essentially. Um, to build upon, upon the previous question and your comments, I mean, for every investigative journalist, there are several people that do public relations in Canada. And this is a, a longstanding trend that's only getting worse. I'm curious to know if when you look historically, you see some interesting trends in what the public relations strategies have looked like and also if you see any cross-pollination between different militaries across the world that are grappling with the same problem yeah i mean it's sort of disorientating working across the C canadian australian u.s and new zealand defense forces i've been working closely with new, new zealand army for the last couple of years and um, in particular, I would say the New Zealand, Canadian, and Australian Defense Forces are so in the same moment <laughs> that it's almost disorientating when you're having conversations. Um, they're all having the exact same conversation around culture change and um, maybe it's so slightly different, different language, but really, you know, they've all sort of put up new offices around culture change, whether it's CPCC or whether it's a different acronym, they have all um, changed um, their sexual misconduct crisis centers or sexual misconduct. I always get the acronyms wrong because I'm working between three different and they're so similar. So it's very similar. And, and 
this is not to say that the, there's very dedicated people trying to solve these complex problems and interested in making the institutions better. Um, and I think there's definitely shared learning. Um, I think there's some there's some evidence of you know failure to learn from one another where there's certain um, you sort of see the same kinds of like I think to be honest I think New Zealand is slightly ahead of this conversation around culture change they've they, they've started it before they're now in the backlash stage <laughs> they're very much like sort of having this conversation about what does um, backlash to um, uh, to what is termed wokeism? What does that look like? I think the Canadian Armed Forces are on the verge of that conversation now. I think we have sort of a lot of conservative voices galvanizing around, well, you know, the real problem is that, you know, wokeism has made the military weak. And I, I actually worry that that's going to be um, sort of a galvanizing narrative around the election. And certainly, um, there's appetite, you know, Jordan Peterson tweeted about this recently, right? Not that I follow him, but I, it was shared shared with me, which I think is really um, concerning. So there's certain patterns, definitely. I don't know, I'm sorry, I, I think I went off a little bit, but but they're they're very much sharing information and trying to learn from each other, but also in, in these same like loops a little bit. If I can insert myself in the queue here and following up on some of these same ideas, I was really interested in your narrative about only military leaders can solve this. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. And sort of, I had a sense that maybe that was driven by this relationship between reporters and PR officers that you have been discussing. Yeah. Yeah, I think some of the um, elements to that narrative are um, will sort of leverage, you know, the, the justice system is different. We have a different workplace culture. There are different sets of circumstances related to sexual violence that require unique solutions or, you know, and I think this has been the, the underlying justification for calls for more reports, more investigations, more uh, reviews, internal reviews um, have often been legitimized by this kind of assumption that in order to understand the very unique nature of this problem, we need such expansive data. And my argument has always been, it's not actually that complex of a problem. The problem has been that we've had high rates of sexual violence and low rates of accountability. That's the problem. And so, you know, institutional reviews can, you know, help us to understand some of the pressure points of, of that, but ultimately, the accountability piece often gets left off. You know, I think about the life cycle of, uh, of sexual violence, sort of the permissive culture, the incident itself, the aftermath and the accountability. And often um, solutions really focus on um, supports for victims. So it's really on this piece, the incidents happen, how can we, you know, change the way that we support victims, give different kind of victim services, um, address, you know, victim harm, which is all very important, but it's often not getting at this permissive culture for sexual violence, or at the other end, how are we ensuring accountability? And if we did have zero tolerance, what might that look like in terms of how we handle allegations? So I think, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for your work. Um, I've asked you this question before, but I'm in, actually, you're a little bit different from the course. <laughs> um, um, I am wondering, you know, you go back to this, uh, you know, going back to the comment you just, the question you just asked about the specificity of military solutions to, you know, kind of military problems, but as you know, in, in the decades we've been working on militarized spaces, this is something that you see in police forces, RCMP, mm -hmm. and the military. Um, and so one of the back that is ongoing right now about the, you know, the, the woke, weakening military or militarized institutions, have you been able in your work to kind of identify the fears of tackling 
sexual misconduct or sexual gender-based violence, the fears of tackling racism in this institution with regards to military efficiency. Mm -hmm. Like, what is the definition of military efficiency mm -hmm. and how do ta does tackling some of these things create fears about challenging a strong, ready mm -hmm. military or militarized space? Yeah. I mean, this is such an important question. And, you know, <laughs> I actually couldn't sleep last night because I was thinking about... Um, the interview I had to do this morning around the case that's on ongoing. And for some reason, I was sort of trying to think of a metaphor that captured, you know, I often, I mean, I get asked to, when I'm, when I'm talking to media, I always get asked, you know, are you hopeful? And yeah. it drives me really crazy. It makes me so angry. And I was trying to think about, you know, these reporters are just doing, you know, it's not, it's not a malicious question. But I guess the metaphor, so just bear with me, I'm going to walk you through my, my <laughs> metaphor, because it's an imperfect one, but I think it's helpful to understand how I see what's happening now. So <laughs> I think the Titanic, and I don't mean this is, I think if we think of culture, you know, toxic culture as the iceberg, um, and that, an you know, an institution that was not really designed to address systemic cultural issues, systemic problem, problematic cultural issues has come into force with toxic culture. So this looks like unsupported veterans. This looks like high rates of internal sexual violence. This looks like um, suicidality. It looks like hazing ongoing. It looks like war crimes, all racism, systemic racism. And I think what stops action is that I think people on the boat and people on the sidelines are like, but these are good people. And this is like, you know, we designed this to be amazing. And so there's still sort of like, how can we back this up and patch it in order to make it all work without really being able to recognize we need to get, get everyone off and regroup and redesign something that's fit for purpose. And I think that's just a, that is a very difficult endeavor and I think it's possible to make that claim without saying that the institution is full of bad people, which it's not. Um, I think it's it's uh, a kind of requires a lot of bravery. Um, I think we still have a lot of senior leaders who are, quite frankly, literally hoping to rearrange deck chairs uh, while the institution is really struggling. And that iceberg is not going anywhere, right? And so I guess... It's an imperfect metaphor because I think sort of some of those aspects of, of toxic culture were baked in, some of them came later. But but for me, it's this idea of the ear, you know, there's no quick fix. There's not really a single office that can be uh, put up to address this problem of, of sexual violence or the broader kind of context of toxic culture that exists within it. And so when I get asked about hope, I sort of think it really shows this lack of understanding of how significant this problem is. Like military sexual violence is one part of really widespread systemic problems, not to mention the overall problem of sort of, you know, how is the military fit for purpose where Canadians' greatest threats are climate change and, and broader kind of conversations that I feel like people just go, whoa. You know, and so I think we have to have these very expansive conversations um, and that that's the most respectful way. That's the best way to respect the people who are actually on the boat trying to figure out and trying to to um, make things better. I don't know if that's helpful. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, military exceptionalism and how much it comes up in uh, in your talk and in your your argument. And I'm like I'm just finding myself sitting a bit uncomfortable with it in the sense that it's like I think a lot uh, about like civilian oversight of the military, civil military relations, and. Like in it just in the sense when when thinking about these topics, because 
on some level, the military should be accountable to politicians and representatives who are, um, who would hopefully be working to like counteract uh, this uh, uh, this problem, like try to undermine this toxic culture. And so I guess I'm curious how um, like civilian politicians, civilian oversight come up in the news coverage you uh, you analyzed, uh, if, if at all, uh, and what you have to say about this more generally. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, civilian oversight, there's always been, <laughs> there's yeah. always been tension between civilian oversight and um, military uh, arguments around the need to do things that institutionally make sense, that may, that civilian oversight, you know, those in, in those civilian positions may or may not understand. Um, and there's great examples related to the scandal. So the Skype scandal I mentioned um, at the time, the Minister of Defense in Australia actually intervened in that case. So the you know the civilian oversight actually overrode uh, military oversight to sort of bring that case, and it caused a huge problem. Um, you know, members of uh, the Australian Defense Forces were furious at the Minister of Defense, um, and there was a whole debate about whether he whether he really knew what he was doing, right, and knew about the consequences for that. And I think you know we have the same kind of conversation right now in terms of um, what it means to have a minister who's really dedicated to particular issues or or is not sort of or may not be as aware of certain issues. So I think, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what to say about that tension, but I will say in terms of military exceptionalism, I think the best example really comes from Shireen Razak's work and she did her, her work looking at the, the Somalia affair uh, from the 1990s in the Canadian Defense Forces and really helped to illustrate how those, war crimes and really like explicit evidence of war crimes were ultimately sort of smoothed over as evidence of the burden of service that 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 job was so difficult and in particular going off to sort of dark places as she uses the language is so difficult that you know violence is sort of something we have to accept as part of the nature of these difficult jobs and so i think that's that's an example of how military exceptionalism can be used to sort of smooth over these contradictions and one of the country you know the contradiction i'm interested in is like why is there such high rates of sexual violence in such a an institution that values discipline and and so i think that helps us to to understand how it gets smoothed over I can ask another one. Um, so you describe this as being a problem that's relatively consistent over time, which is something that makes sense to me. But then you also look at these case studies of scandals. I'm curious if those case studies or if your other research reveals like how these particular issues become scandalized. Mm -hmm. Why is it the case that we see high levels of attention around certain instances of violence and then lack of attention at other mm -hmm. kinds of moments. What defines these, these scandals? Yeah. I mean, Ben Wadham in Australia has written on this much, you knows can say much, I think much better in terms of defining, um, helping to understand what makes the threshold. And it's, it's really a, a puzzle because there's some cases that you think would be in the public interest. So for example, in Australia, there was a case of a 15 year old cadet um, that um, raised allegations of sexual violence against a trainer. And during, you know, there was the trial took so long and, and that individual was um, reprimanded in the meantime and um, uh, ended up taking their own life. So that's a huge case that you think is in the public interest because this is a 15 year old. 
it did not there were like one story on it the only reason i knew about it is as it came up i read through the legal proceedings um and so i think sometimes cases become scandalous in part when victims go to the media so the skype scandal became a scandal in part because um the victim survivor went to the media because she did not feel like the the institution was going to handle it effectively so some of these cases involve direct interaction with media um i mean cases like tailhook where there's just sort of like dozens of of victims or very kind of salacious details i think but um yeah i mean i i really don't know why exactly i think sometimes there's a, a particular moment when people are ready to have that conversation um you know i think if you think about the hockey canada case that case exists from 2018 and i think it came to become a scandal in the context of wider conversations around sexual violence and this desire to sort of dig up and look further into it. So sometimes it's also about public timing in terms of um, readiness for a particular conversation. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, in one of your uh, older research on uh, the rebel groups in Sierra Leone, you reported on sexual violence happening as uh, part of uh, hazing rituals among the rebels, but also being very well integrated into the, in the culture of uh, bushwives. So sort of like a, as a result of a power dynamics between someone who was forcibly conscripted uh, in the unit and then uh, was abused by, I don't want to say officers, but elders of the unit. Uh, do we see, uh, so like now in terms of Canadian military, American military, uh, uh, Australian military, do we see most of the attacks happening or the assaults happening as part of hazing rituals or is it more about a power dynamic between like, like, uh, really super, uh, senior officers going on, uh, younger, uh, members, uh, the low ranking uh, members of the military or is it? Are we able to tell? Is it mostly the hazing culture, or is it mostly most of the power dynamics? Yeah. Um. So, I mean, hazing culture has definitely changed over the last decade in all of the defense forces. I think there's been official policy changes and official practices. I think there's lots of evidence that some of those practices are are more underground as they are in other institutions where hazing has has existed, including universities. Um. I think. Uh. You know. I will say for the US, we have good data around where it happens, power dynamics, which bases, you know, it's army, <laughs> army and the Marines. Um, and it's often in um, often an abuse of power, but not always. Um, and for the Canadian Armed Forces, we don't have great data. We don't have that kind of disaggregated data to know, like, are there particular uh military bases that have higher rates of sexual violence than others that would be very helpful information to sort of know where to target resources we know for example that um you know which of the military installations in in the u.s has the highest rates so i think um i guess my my takeaway or my main point is to sort of um really draw attention to the way that even less dramatic hazing practices can still legitimize expressions of violence and sexual sexualized violence as normalized in a culture. And I think that that's still ongoing. And I think these sort of practices or, or normalized low level behaviors, I think are still rampant across all the defense forces. Um, and so I think that's that's the thing to pay attention to. Thank you so much. That does bring us right about to the end of our time. Uh, before we thank Professor McKenzie again, I just want to say that we do have the room until two o'clock. And so if Professor McKenzie is willing to hang around and answer a few extra questions, uh, that's perfectly uh, fine. Please grab some additional food on your way out. But let's uh, thank again, once again, uh, Professor McKenzie. Thank you. Thank you.